My name's Beverly Bean, and um, I was married 18 years, and um, now divorced. I've got four children, two lovely girls, two lovely boys. When were you born? 3rd of May 1958, 38. Where were you born? I was born in Hemel Hempstead, actually. So you lived in Hemel Hempstead all the time? Um, in and out of Hemel Hempstead, just out of, um, just out of the way a little bit, you know. Uh, my dad was in the American Air Force and he didn't have like a council house or anything so we had like private houses you know so we moved quite a bit. Do you have any brothers and sisters? Yeah I've got two sisters one older one younger Harriet and Kathleen. Is your father and your mother alive? My mum's alive my dad died in um, February 1986. Right you've got quite an extraordinary story to tell haven't you? Well <clears throat> the story I suppose to everybody else is extraordinary yeah but the way it came about is more extraordinary to me, not, not the actual story. Because I have to believe it. My dad was such a very truthful man that, you know, and when we were kids, he would reward us rather than punish us for telling the truth. If we'd done something bad, you know, we'd go to him and say straight away, look, Dad, we've done this. And he'd pat us on the back saying, good for coming to tell me, but you shouldn't have done it, you know. Mm. So he was a very truthful man. Very, um, he loved his country. Uh, the only reason he didn't go back to his own country is because my mother... Which was, was very ill. The United States. The United States, yeah. yeah. Was uh, ill and she couldn't be away from her family. They had to come back to England and settle down here. So he got transferred back to uh, England. But they did go to Florida and that's where my eldest sister was born. Mm -hmm. What was he in the army? He was, he was just a cook, for goodness sake. That's mm -hmm. all. I mean, it wasn't anything else. You know, I suppose everyone, just anyone who was there was grabbed to go out and stand guard duty and muck in sort of thing. I think the first time I ever heard his story was the landing on the moon. I think that was 1969, is it? 69? Is that right? He made us all sit and watch it, yeah. And we weren't really interested. We were only little. I think I was about, phew, must have been about nine, ten, something like that. And uh, he made us all sit and watch it. And then he told us this story about how when he was um, stationed out in the desert in America, he'd seen a crash disc. And uh, we never, at that age, didn't take much notice. A crashed disc? Yeah, he What's said that? that, well, UFO, I suppose. Mm -hmm. And he said that, um, he didn't tell us the story in detail then, when we were really young. But he said that Daddy's seen one and they're real, that type of thing. And as we got older, he told us all the story about half a dozen times or so, no more than about a dozen, I'd say. Every time, say, something really sort of, I, I suppose, jerked his memory in the paper or he'd seen something on television. He'd tell us this story. It always went the same way and my sisters would tell it the same way as well. Had your dad ever talked about UFOs before 69? Never. Never talked about them any other time apart from when he told this story. In 69? Um, no, he, not even to my mum or anybody. He, um, he always told the story the same way. He used to say, you know, daddy's seen a, uh, a flying disc. It was in the desert. He said all available men were grabbed and they all had to go into the desert and stand in a ring around this crash disc. I did tell one of my uncles that it was at an angle into the sand, yeah, buried into the sand. Just remember that bit. But he always told us that they were told to look but not look, not to take anything in or they get into a lot of trouble. And he said, and then he had to sit on the back of a, a truck and they, uh, me and my sisters can't remember if it was, they had dry ice in those days or if it was ordinary ice, but some sort of ice in the truck and they couldn't understand why. Him and another guy had to sit in the truck with guns and um, they were told not to look under the tarpaulin but if you knew my dad, you know, he, he would have had a sneaky look. And he did and he said he saw these bodies. Now, when we, bodies <coughs> I think he said two, mm -hmm. but I think my sister says three. Mm -hmm. So it's just memory. Like I said, he never told the story very often. Mm -hmm. And uh, we used to giggle, yeah, like crazy and say, go on, you know, what were they like? Was it scary? And he used to say, hell no, he said, they look like, they have friendly faces. He said they look a little bit Asian looking, Asiatic looking, he said. Um, slanted eyes, much, much bigger heads than we have, you know, to go with the rest of their body in proportion, yeah. They looked about four foot tall. Now, he used to say they looked yellowish, but apparently anybody else who saw the body, so he says grey, but you remember the tarpaulin is going to be a green colour. So whether or not it's just where he was under the, you know, the truck cover. And... Um, he said that they they definitely didn't look human, they weren't human at all. And, well, were uh, they naked bodies? He didn't say. That's all he used to say, really. This was where? This, well, he never used to say. He used to say out in the desert. Mm -hmm. 
and it wasn't until after he died that we realised it was the Roswell crash. Oh, right, so yeah. you never actually said Roswell? No, never, ever. No, we'd never heard of the place. Right, and and did he ever give a date? Nope. As to when this happened? Nope, nope. He Not just nope. basically said that there was... Well, he was sworn to secrecy, but he always, always finished up by saying, whatever you do, don't tell anyone you get daddy into a lot of trouble. So, of course, we never did. He did say that another time he had to stand guard duty outside a hangar where a crash disc was stored and his commanding officer came up and said, come on Brownie, let's have a look inside. But everything was packed up and ready to be flown out to um, Texas the next morning so they didn't see anything. What do you think he decided to talk about it in 69? Um, <clears throat> well, I think he, I don't know, perhaps he was waiting to see something on the moon. I suppose everyone was waiting to see if there was anything up there, you know. I can't remember watching his face or whether he was disappointed or excited or what, but... Uh, and what were your feelings when he told you this at the time, if you remember? Well, I was only about nine or ten, I think, so... Mm. Giggly, really. Mm. Just giggly. Did you used to ask him to tell the story again? Well, not till I was a teenager. And then Close Encounters of the Third Kind came out on television. Didn't see it with pictures, but on television. And I remembered Dad's story and I thought, wow, you know, go down to me Dad. So I went down to my Dad's house. And um, I said, you've got to watch this film, you've got to watch this film, because it might be something like you told us about. He watched the film, went down the next day, and to my disappointment, he said it was a load of SHIT. <laughs> he said it was nothing like what he'd seen. And um, I tried to question him, that's the first time I'd ever tried to question him, right? And uh, he got angry and said, look, I've told you enough, I can't tell you any more, don't pester me. That's all you need to know. But th what makes me angry is that he, he had to carry that bloody thing with him all those years, you know? No hell, you know? That's what upsets me. All those years, I mean, 20 odd years he was in the Air Force, Army and then Air Force. And um, no counselling, as far as I can see, no pat on the back or anything. Apart from that le the promotion? This is 19, 7th of May 1948. Recommendation for promotion to enlisted man, of enlisted man. And um, it's to the commanding officer, Squadron D, 509th there drone group, Walker Air Force Base, Roswell, New Mexico. And uh, I recommend that Sergeant Melvin E. Brown be promoted to the grade of Staff Sergeant. Sergeant Brown has diligently and industriously performed all duties assigned to him while on duty with Task Unit 741. I don't know what that was. During the, pecu the peculiar and tedious circumstances resulting from this project, he clearly demonstrated the qualities and abilities desired of a Staff Sergeant. Have you got any other documents there? Um, just um, the bits and pieces that we found after he died of um, just really just proving that he was actually stationed in Roswell. I mean, some of them have got Jesse Marcel's orders on them as well. Who's Jesse Marcel? Well, Jesse Marcel was uh, the commanding officer, wasn't he? Of mm -hmm. the 509th. I think he was... I can't remember exactly what department he was in. Intelligence, I think. Something like that. I think the reason that my dad was so angry when he was dying was because he didn't know where he was going. He didn't know if he was going to this place they say in the Bible or he was going up there with these little bloody aliens running around, you know. He didn't know what was happening. The whole week that he was dying, that's all he was worried about. He wasn't, he wasn't saying, I love you, and saying, you know, his goodbyes. All he was worried about, even in his sleep, was this damn place called Roswell, New Mexico that we had never heard of. But there was a programme on television about um, a book called Chariot of the Gods, mm. yeah, where well, they were linking like UFOs to the Bible and that type of thing. He kept asking if we could try and get this book for him, and I thought, oh my god, this is weird, the only books he ever reads is Zane Grey, you know, because he, he once met Zane Grey when he was a young boy, and uh, he loved cowboy books. And uh, we thought, oh, this is bloody weird, but he, he managed to get hold of this book from somebody at work, I think. I can remember him looking in the Bible, looking in the book, looking in the Bible, looking in the book. Now this is why I say the story is amazing, but how, how we found out. It's been quite a few years since he told the story. He became ill, he died. Um, while he was dying, he kept saying, I tried to feed him some eggs one day, he wouldn't eat these eggs. And he was saying something, his words were slurred. And it sounded like raisins. And I said, raisins, Dad, what are you talking about? He said, they're raisins. So I said, what are raisins? And he just like this and looked away from me. And I said, well, in the eggs, is it a recipe? Because he cooked, yeah. So I said, and he went, oh, like this. He said, they're coming for me, they're coming for you, they're in Texas. And like the other time, he made everybody that was there in the room at the time sign this um, piece of paper about this federal bank with this trust fund in it that had been given to him. He wouldn't tell us why. And when he wouldn't tell us why, one of my, I think it was my brother-in-law, 
said to him, oh, what you do, Mel, rob a bank? And he got angry and he said, I've never done anything wrong for my country. He said, this is, you know, Uncle Sam business, that type of thing. He said, this was something that was given to me and I want you to go and find it for Mummy because Mummy deserves this money. And uh, we did try. We phoned up lots of banks. The original federal bank that he gave us the address of is not existent anymore, it doesn't exist. Um, and uh, I can't remember exactly which bank. I had so many in front of me. I phoned up one and I said, look, my dad died. He said he had a trust fund uh, from 1947. Um, and she said, well, does this, yes, we do have some, something like that, she said, does it, does this number begin with a 5-2? So I said, yeah, you know, I put my hand over the phone while she click clopped off, I could hear her click clopping off. I looked around at my mum, I was going, yeah, you know, something's happening here. And then she came back, she said, sorry, we have nothing like that, have a nice day, and put the phone down. And I thought, oh, ticking off list, you know, he kept his mouth shut all those years. They said, there'll be some money for you, Mel, you know, when you're old brownie, when you've kept your mouth shut. And when your days are over, you know, get the money for your wife. But it's just a ticking off list, swine. Even in his sleep, he was just, Roswell, and we'd never heard of this place. And this is what, what is truly amazing, yeah, because he died, and we thought, well, what the hell did he ever do for Uncle Sam that was so hush-hush, you know, and all this secrecy? What could have worried him so much? And uh, we got together, and the only thing that we could think of was this, this UFO story he used mm -hmm. to tell. We thought we'd ask somebody. So my ex-husband asked somebody he worked with, who was uh, into UFOs and stuff like that, if he'd ever heard of a place called Roswell, New Mexico. So this guy says, well, yeah, you know, it's the most famous case history of a crash disc ever. And he gave this book to us to read, and it was by um, uh, Burlitz and Moore. And uh, we read this book and we just couldn't believe it. You know, it was all like what our dad had told us. And then my mum went upstairs and she started going through all the papers and everything that my dad had left behind and found these papers with Roswell, New Mexico and the man that was telling most of the story in the book, Major Jesse Marcel you know, was my dad's commanding officer or whatever you want to call him you know, it was amazing stuff there were these papers and everything then, my sister saw Timothy Good on TVAM and he was talking about his new book, Above Top Secret and he mentioned Roswell, New Mexico so she told me to phone him up I phoned up TVAM and they got in contact with the publishers I think and he phoned me and uh, he came round to our house and um, of course he helped us because we were in shock I, I tell you honestly we were in shock you know we were just wandering about and it's not funny knowing this you know and I don't want to make money out of this and I, I don't care who knows anymore because the simple fact of the matter is I just want a letter to say sorry I just want something to say sorry you don't have to put up with that all that all those years I mean, it's no joke for me either. Fancy knowing half a secret, the most fantastic secret in the whole wide world. I only know half, mm -hmm. if half, mm -hmm. if that much. Mm -hmm. And, you know, am I ever going to find out the rest? Possibly. Possibly. I mean, these men really, they, they should have been told everything. Mm. You know, if they are hiding any secrets, the men that were involved should have been the first people to know everything, just to clear their, in their minds and say, okay, yeah, okay, we understand that's going on, but no, and I think that's dreadful, terrible. Do you give any idea as to how many people might have actually witnessed the crash? All available men were grabbed, so you've got to think, really, it's got to be somebody who knows something about the base, yeah? I mean, but I mean, there must have been quite a few of them taking people from the kitchen staff as well, you know, everyone had to go, mm -hmm. yeah? But the thing with my dad was he was an A1 rifleman, yeah? So I, th I should imagine that would count. Mm. All he says is that he had to stand guard duty, look, but not look, not to take anything in. They did, they were going to be court martialed. And the other time he, he was standing guard duty outside the hangar where a crash disc was stored. Mm. And um, his commanding officer came up and said, Let's have a look inside. I suppose they were all curious. Mm. But imagine having to live with that, you know, all your life and not ever know any answers. Mm. And if they've got answers, then they should damn well, if, all right, if they're not going to let the public know, mm. then they should let the people involved know. Mm. But that's what makes me angry. It's this damn Roswell thing, you know? If I'd met an alien, yeah, and he said, hi, you know, I'm from blah, blah, blah. And then I couldn't tell anyone, imagine that, you know? Imagine. Mm. It must desperately, all those years, wanted to tell somebody mm. or know a little bit more about it, mm. just to ease his mind. Mm. A couple of years after my dad had died, we got, of all things, a signed letter from Ronald Reagan through the post, thank you for all your services, Melvin Brown. 
oh, two years after he died, thank you very much. You know? They didn't even think of doing anything like that. I mean, it would have made these men feel better maybe if they'd been given a piece of paper to say thank you for being quiet all those years and, you know, that would have made them feel a little bit better, wouldn't it? But nothing. Meanies. I used to be proud to be American. I wasn't born there or anything, but I always used to think of myself as being m more American than English. I don't know why, but I did. Just the way I was brought up, I suppose. And um, not anymore. Not anymore. Because if they know more, I think they're so mm. bloody mean. But don't you think that would be the case with any government? Doesn't no matter what country. They don't <laughs> like that. I don't know. I, I, mean, I, the I think the British government probably knows as much as the Americans, but they also wouldn't allow anyone to talk about it, and we'd probably treat them. In the same manner. Yeah, I don't know. I, I I tend to think that maybe the Americans know more than any other country do. Mm -hmm. I, I don't think all the countries know as much as they do, mm -hmm. and therefore I feel a bit biased that they're meaner than everybody else. <laughs> uh, now I can understand that it would make people panic. Maybe um, it would certainly upset religions and things. But with all the stuff on television and kids, I mean, kids aren't scared of them, you know. They've been brought up with aliens and UFOs. Medals were American Defense Service Medal, American Campaign Medal. What's that one? Asiatic Pacific, Pacific Campaign, Campaign Medal. Medal. Philippine Liberation Ribbon with one bronze star, Good Conduct Medal, and Victory Medal. Medal. My name's Harriet Kircher. Um, coming up 36. Married. Three kids, three little monsters like all kids are. I don't know if I work, I'm home care, go around look after all the old people. Tell us about Roswell and your dad. Well, <coughs> it's sort of when we were little, we used to come out with a silly story. What story? Well, about a UFO crashing. Um, really, all he used to say is, well, he said, I saw one once, and we used to say, well, what's that then, Dad? And he used to say, well, when I was at the station there, out in the desert, he said that uh, one crashed and that they all had to go out to it. And I said, well, did they tell you what it was? He said, no, we didn't know what it was until sort of afterwards. But when they got there, they all had to stand in a circle. Uh, he had to get on the back of a truck. Mm -hmm. And he got on the back of the truck, which Charlie, they put the Jack, bodies inside, and he looked underneath when he shouldn't have. Uh, then they went back to the base. He went in with somebody, I don't know whether it was a colonel or whoever, but they said, Reverend Brownie, let's go in and have a look at the bodies. And they went in there, but they'd already been packed up, you know, and ready to be shipped out. The officer said, let's, Brownie, let's go take a look. Another time, they say, I stand guard duty. That's yeah. right. Yeah. You know, yeah. so, I mean, it was weird, you know. How did you meet, Mel? I met him in 48. Mm -hmm. Beginning of la later latter part of forty eight. In America. No, here. Yeah. He was stationed where? At Bovenden. Mm -hmm. I stood to him. I stood next to him so many times and took no notice of him. Uh huh. And then finally, I uh, he came into a dance hall and I had a dance with him because I'd been standing on the waiting to go dance. <laughs> And he was the only one dancing with his hat on, and I said to my girlfriend, come on, we're not going to be wallflowers. We're going to pick the next two blokes that come round. And uh, I picked him, and he couldn't dance. <laughs> and uh, as he, I kept telling her at the back of him to come round and excuse me, but she wouldn't. I went out one door, I said to him, I'm going home now, so I said goodnight to you. And he was walked behind me all the way out through the other door and come back in again, and he says, uh, I thought you was going home. I said, no, I've just come back to clip me coat. But he didn't, he ended up seeing me home. Did you believe him when you talked about him? I always believed in everything he said. He was that kind of man. We did my cooking. <laughs> <laughs> when was the first time he ever mentioned it to you? When you see a little bit in the paper? Yeah, there was a bit in the paper. I can't remember if it... Well, I say it was the Daily Mirror because that's what he always used to read and that's what was always delivered. And uh, it, it was there was a little bit, bit in that. And he, used to, he said, oh, he said, I, I was there, I, I, I was there when that happened. And then another time I can remember going out with my friend, one time that sticks in my mind, and this is going back, I suppose it must have been the 70s, and I can remember we were walking down the main road that we've got here in Hemel, 
and we were walking down the road and as I was walking up there was this light above my head and I can remember sort of thinking what's that and my friend was you know say about four yards in front of me so I was trying to sort of talk to her but without saying anything because it frightened me mm. and she said what's the matter and as she turned round, it just zoomed off. Well, we ran like the clappers into the house, running into the living room and everything, and then we said to Dad what we'd seen, and then he come out with the little story again. You know, but I mean, and then when he'd finished, he'd say, well, don't say anything because you will get me into trouble. He did say, he said, he said it because I can remember him saying it to you, not to be frightened, didn't he? Yeah, so he did. don't always say don't be frightened. Mm -hmm. Carol said it at the same time as you did, and you yeah. both come running in, yeah. and your father says to you, What's the matter with you two? And you two and said, cool, we just seen something over the back of our head. Gary came in la right. la afterwards and you said, did you see it? And he said, did he see it? He saw it as well. He said he see it zooming off. And your father turned around and said, well, there's nothing to be afraid of. You only told the story of something. Yeah, it's something reminded him of it. Um, it's like when Close Encounters came out. I mean, he turned around and said, that's a load of bullshit. I mean, he did not think that that was a very good film was it at all. all of it or just bits of it or the aliens in it? Um, all of it, I think. All of it, I think, really. I think he was... Like, he, he said the UFOs didn't like anything he'd ever seen. Right. I'll tell you what he did read a lot, and that was that one, that, that book. Chariot of the Gods. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And he was always, he, he did used to read the, the Bible as well, because if he used to get worried over anything or anything like that, he'd sit down and read that. And that's what really bothers me about this thing about Roswell. It's not the fact that it happened and that there's aliens out there. I couldn't care less, to be quite honest. They don't bother me at all. Mm. But the thing that really does bother me is that when Dad was dying, and I think that had played on his mind, yeah. and he must have been thinking, well, where in the hell am I going? Yeah. Do you know what I mean? If it's sort of somebody that's not interested in UFOs or anything like that, they think, oh, well, it's he a heaven, afraid, was it's a hell, you know, you die, you're going so-and-so, which everybody... He wasn't afraid. About. It was he? he no, wasn't, he wasn't that, afraid. That wasn't afraid. Man, but that wasn't afraid. But I mean, it was the things that he was coming out with. He kept saying they're going back to Texas, that we couldn't figure out what he was saying. And he was also saying, um, what was it else he was saying? He was saying that they're here and... They're coming to, uh, they're coming to me, they're coming, coming for you. Me. They're coming for me and they're coming for you. And that is what he kept saying. And we kept saying, well, what are you on about? I mean, he got... I just kept saying they're in Texas. They're in Texas and then... And I mean, it wasn't until a few weeks later that it, the penny sort of dropped because I was sitting watching uh, GMTV, as it was in them days, and Timothy Good was on it. And he was on there going on about Roswell, New Mexico, and, uh, you know, a, a crash disc that happened there. And I thought, hello, you know, this is, sounds like what Dad was. So I phoned her up, got her up out of bed, got her to phone up, you know, TVAM or whatever it's called, and he did get in contact with us again, didn't he? And then he came to see us. And I mean, that's really how it started. That um, thing in Florida, wasn't it? Oh, yeah. we did. When we were stationed in Florida, we were sitting all sitting out in the... Well, the, the houses there were in a cul-de-sac. Six that way, six that way, six that way. We were sitting with another couple and it was, oh, it was getting about nine o'clock and night was coming in. And uh, we happened to all be looking up and we see this thing. In fact, we watched it for an hour, shooting across. It wasn't, didn't shoot, it went in, looked like it went into a big cloud sort of thing. Then we're still looking at it. And all of a sudden it came out the other end, but it was an hour we'd watched that because my neck, my neck was aching. So this other fellow was uh, in the uh, weather balloon place. And he, yeah, and he went in and uh, he telephoned, because there was a telephone at the bottom of that block. And he said, are you watching it on screen? He said, we have it on screen. So we see a fine source of them, mm -hmm. but my husband never said anything. He, but he's, he said, didn't he say that they? He said no, it's nothing to worry about because they're up there all the time. Yeah, well, he did say, well, that's that nothing. But I know I've got to flip through it. But he says that's that's nothing. He said uh, more than likely loads over about. That that was a security base too. That was um, Eglin Air Force Base. Is it the phone? We've bugged. That's what should be the We fought that actually before, haven't we? Still running. Are we being bugged? Yes. Oh, good. No. Ooh, uh. <laughs> Do you think it's a bug? It's mother, is it? <laughs> Could well be. Well, when have you been thinking about? What do you mean, me? Um, when we went to um, the autopsy film. Listen, when we were invited to the autopsy film. Yeah. Oh. When we got home uh, from there, I phoned up Beverly on one occasion for some reason. As I picked the phone up to talk to her, the phone click do you know what i mean mm -hmm. so somebody else had picked a phone up a few minutes after beverly had mm -hmm. 
and uh, it happened quite a few times, didn't it? It happened about two or three times, actually. It was really peculiar. And it was after you saw the yeah, it was, World's World autopsy film? Yeah, that happened, well, it was about that very night, wasn't it? So we started acting stupid down the phone and saying stupid things. So there wasn't nothing, I mean, if they'd done that, they wouldn't find nothing out anyway, because we've got nothing to hide, and everything we've said, we've said before anyway. This one is of my dad. In 1947, in the yearbook at Roswell, New Mexico. According to the records, my father was never there. So why is his picture in, in the, the yearbook? yearbook? If my dad was alive, he would have kicked our butts. He wouldn't have let us do this.